I'll explain Kepler's three laws at a high school level. We have Johannes Kepler, who discovered three natural laws. And we have Isaac Newton, who also discovered three other natural laws. As you can see from the time periods in which they lived, Newton was born after Kepler. And in fact, Isaac Newton's ideas were inspired from Kepler's ideas. Those laws are quite related. Today, we are only going to talk about Kepler's laws. Before anything, let me ask you about this. We have a circle here. Where is its center? I'm talking about its focal point. Of course, here, in the middle, right? How about this one then? It's an ellipse. You might think that it's in the middle as well, but no. The centers of the ellipse are here. Ellipses actually have two centers, or two foci, when circles have only one focus. Why? Let me show you. So did you get it? You could think of this as two foci coming into single focus as the ellipse turns into the circle. Make sense? Now we are going to mathematically describe this shape using eccentricity. Eccentricity tells how elliptic it is. Let me ask you something. How elliptical is this circle? Does it have any ellipticness? No. No ellipticness. What number could we use for no ellipticness then? Zero, right? Eccentricity of a circle is zero. So if we say that these are orbits of planets, the eccentricity of one pretty much means an orbit that will never let anything come back. The planets will just escape from our solar system because it stretched infinitely. Johannes Kepler loved this kind of concept. He loved ellipses. Now, Johannes Kepler was an astronomer, if you didn't know. He used to record how planets orbit around the sun. And one day, he drew Earth's orbit based on his recorded data. Then he noticed something. The orbit looked slightly elliptic. In this drawing, I exaggerated a bit. Our Earth's orbit isn't this elliptic, but it's still elliptic. The eccentricity of Earth is about 0.017, so it's almost zero, almost a circle but it's still slightly elliptic. And that's what Kepler noticed from his precise measurements. So forgive me if it looks too stretched. Anyway, Kepler was excited about this and decided to mark its two foci. And you know what happened? When he drew the sun on the location based on his observation, he noticed that the sun is located exactly in one of the two foci that he drew. Hold on still. He also noticed that when he drew the orbits of the other planets, one of the two foci of all the planets overlapped. And the location where all the foci are overlapped was where the sun is. This was crazy. At that time, it was considered arrogant for humans to try to understand and predict God's moves. What Kepler did was very against God, just like Galileo. He didn't need God to understand the solar system. He simply used math to understand it. This was his first law. The orbits of the planets are ellipses with the sun at one of the two foci. Now let's talk about his second law. This is the famous Halley's Comet, named by Edmund Halley. Even if you didn't know, your parents may know about this comet, because some of them have probably seen it with their eyes. And what is this famous for? It's famous for having appeared in many ancient records. 
This comet's orbit is so elliptic that it almost escapes our solar system. 0.967, you see? It's almost 1. So this comet comes close to us every 75 years almost. That's a long period. The last close approach was 1986. That's why I said your parents might know this. And the next one is predicted to be 2061. How old am I by then? 70 or something. Yeah, a little old. I can watch that. So why am I talking about Halley's Comet? Uh, just because I would need an extreme orbit for a better visualization and giving you a better understanding, okay? So let's say the comet traveled this much in 10 years. How far would the comet go in the same 10 years? The same distance as it traveled before? That's B. Or a bit shorter? Or a bit farther? The hint is, consider the gravitational pull by the sun. The answer is A. It should go a bit farther. That's because the comet is now closer to the sun, so of course it'll feel a stronger gravitational pull, right? Halley's orbital period was almost 80 years, so let's just say it took 40 years to reach the other end. And by the way, the tail of the Halley's comet starts facing the sun as it gets closer and closer. That's because its tail is formed by the evaporation of gas due to hot temperature. Just some extra knowledge. Anyway, back to the Kepler's law. I'll draw line segments like this, so it connects the sun and the comet. And let me also color these areas. Kepler noticed that the areas formed by equal time intervals are equal. Even if you divide by different time intervals, I'm pretty sure you'll get pieces with an equal area as well. Trust me. What a surprise! This was a very mathematical discovery. A line segment joining a planet and the sun sweeps out equal areas in equal amounts of time. And you remember how I said Newton's laws were inspired from Kepler's laws? This Kepler's second law was the crucial one for developing the Newton's laws. Because this has to do with the rate of change of the area. And some of you may already know that the rate of change of something is related to calculus. Like Newton and the other mathematician Leibniz, they invented calculus. Anyway, this was the Kepler's second discovery. This one is the easiest one. It's the formula to find the orbital period of something that's orbiting around something. And we just need to know how to use this formula. I'll bring Earth and Sun as an example. Let's find out the orbital period of the Earth. As you can see, g is the gravitational constant that we all know. This one is the sun mass and the earth mass combined. And sometimes, you'll see this formula without the small m in other textbooks. And that's because the earth mass is too small compared to the sun's. So we just ignore it. So this is actually the sun's mass. This a is called the semi-major axis. So if you look at the diagram, semi-major axis is this, the longer radius. And we can calculate it from these. The shorter length to the sun is called perihelion, and the longest length is called aphelion. We just need to add the two lengths and divide that by two. So it's like an average value of the distances. Let's plug in the numbers now. I got this number. What should the unit be? Let's find out. We had meters cubed on top, and the gravitational constant had this unit, you see here. And we multiply that by the mass. So these are cancelled, these are cancelled, and we'll be left with this. But we had to square root it at the end, so let's do the same thing. We'll get seconds as the unit. So 3.1533 times 10 to the 7 seconds. And you see, we were using this formula to find this orbital period. So having second as a unit makes sense. Now let's try one last thing. Let's try to convert this into the number of days. You'll get approximately 365 days. And what is that? That's literally the time it takes for Earth to go around the sun once, right? Isn't this cool? This was Kepler's third law, showing how the semi-major axis is proportional to the orbital period. 